Right, so today we're going to be looking at the topic that we had the other day, which was chemical analysis, and it's the question to do with that. So it's the chromatography question from a specimen paper. And it's how chemical analysis will be tested in your exams. So you've got a student investigating food dyes using paper chromatography. So if you remember, that was showed you how things rise. This is the method used. They put a spot of food coloring X on the start line, um, four separate dyes, and they place the bottom of the paper in water for several minutes. Now, straight away looking at that, it's saying you should need to write down two mistakes that the student made in setting up this experiment. So hopefully you can see that a mistake, the water line here is above the start line. So what would happen, what would the problem be? So it's too high, right? So the water line, water level is above the start line. Everything would just dissolve, start line. And the other mistake, it tells you that the start line was drawn in ink. So because the water level is above the start line, the food colors would dissolve into the water. And the fact it's drawn into ink, the ink would run on paper. So when you do this experiment at school, you'll see that you, you, you don't use ink, you use a pencil line, and you, put, you don't put the whole thing into the water. So those are the two mistakes that have been made. Okay, so let's go on to the next part of that question. So the next part of the question says another student set it up correctly. So even if you hadn't done the first bit and you couldn't work out what they'd done wrong, you would hopefully turn and have a look here and you can see that the start line looks a little bit different and maybe you could go back and you could fix your answer from the previous bit. It says calculate the RF value of dye A. Now, if you remember, we had to measure and it was the amount RA had moved right to the top value. So what would you would do is you would need to measure this line here. So you'd need to measure this total line here. So you'd measure it with a ruler and you would also need to measure this line here. So when you measure them, you end up with, this comes out to be 8.2 centimeters and this comes out to be 2.8 centimeters. Now they allow for you being out by 0.1 of a centimeter either way, in case you've measured it slightly differently, you've gone to a different place on the dot, but you essentially want the distance moved by A and the distance moved by the solvent. So if you're right, working out RF value for dye A, what you're calculating is the distance moved by A, and you're dividing that by the distance moved by the solvent. So here we're gonna have 2.8 divided by 8.2. And when you put that in the calculator, you get 0 0.34. So the answer to that part of the question would be 0 0.34. Now it tells you that dye D has an RF value of 0 0.8. Calculate the distance moved on the chromatography paper. So remember what we said, the RF value is the distance moved by whatever we're measuring, so moved by D in this case, over the distance moved by solvent, which is right to the top line. So what information do we know here? We know that RF is 0 0.8. This is what we want to find. So this is our X if we want to convert it almost mass-wise. And we worked out the distance moved by solvent was 8.2. So 
So something divided by 8.2 gives us 0.8. That something is going to have to be 0.8 times by, I'm sorry, times by 8.2. Let me try to rewrite that better. So 0.8 multiplied by 8.2. And when you plug that into your calculator, you get 6.6. .6. So the distance moved and you need to have centimeters here. Where in science, we have to be quite careful with that. Okay. Then it says to explain how the different dyes in X are separated by paper chromatography. So let's go back and let's have a look at X. So we're looking at, we're explaining, how many marks was it? It's four marks. And we're explaining how the different dyes in X are separated. So what happens? What's happening is the solvent is moving through the paper. Different dyes have different solubilities. So they have different attractions to the paper and therefore they are carried to a different distance. So that's your four marks. You're saying, as the solvent moves through the paper, it's made up of these different dyes. Now, each of these different dyes um, has a different solubility, so how soluble it is, and then it attracts to the paper at different times, and so they are carried different distances, and that's your four marks or your four points. So let's write that down. We have the solvent moves through the paper, up the paper, anything like that. So through paper. The different colors or different dyes, they have different solubilities, different solubilities. Solubilities, I can't spell, I told, said this before, in solvents and they get attracted and different attractions. So different attractions to the paper. The paper, and so they move, or you can write carried different distances. And that's the way chromatography works. So you've got the solvent, it's moving through the paper, depending on the dye, they have different solubilities. So there's different attractions. So they move different distances. Right, let's take the next bit of this question. So this whole question relates to that topic. So flame, so this is the bit that we didn't do and this is the higher level bit, but we'll use, it's a very similar concept. So even if you, don't hadn't done this topic, you'd hopefully be able to see how it works. So you've got flame emission spectroscopy, I can't talk say, can be used to analyze metal ions. You have to use this, the spectra to identify the two metal ions in the mixture. Now, essentially, you want to see where they sort of match up. So which, this is a mixture of two things. So which two of these combined give you this? So we know, well, hopefully you can see, you've got this pattern and this pattern. So you can see you're gonna have calcium ions. So if you follow the pattern along, it looks like it's the same till you get about here where you've got some extra lines and you've got an extra line here. Now, if you go up, on that line, you'll see that relates to sodium. So we can see it's made up of calcium and sodium ions. So you'd say Ca2 plus and Na plus. So those are the two metal ions it's made up of. So the same thing like in the paper chromatography where you're looking along to see what it could be made up of, um, that's what you do there. Okay, 
So we said this was Ca2 plus and Na plus. So now explain why a flame test could not be used. Now the problem is, if you had a flame test, a flame test is useful when you've got one thing and you want the color to come out and it's really bright. So we know that calcium comes out like an orangey red, sodium comes out yellow, but when you mix them together, the colors will mask each other. So the reason you can, can't use a flame test is because you have two different colors that would be masked, that would, that would either, you could say they would mix and mask each other, each other. And, you know, to show that you know your information, um, even if, I don't think in this question, because it's two marks, you probably wouldn't need this, but calcium two plus, you could say is orange red. And Na plus is yellow. Yeah, especially if you've learned it, you want to give the examiner all the information that you know. As long as it's correct information, you're not going to be losing marks. Okay. So the very last bit of this question is two students tested a green compound X. The students added water to the compound X and it didn't dissolve. Okay. The students then added a solution of ethanoic acid. A gas was produced, which turned lime water milky, right? So the minute you see that you're thinking, okay, carbon dioxide. Student A concluded compound X was sodium carbonate and student B concluded it was copper chloride. Which student, if any, was correct? Explain your reasoning. Right, so let's go right from the beginning. What are we told at the start? We're told it's a green compound. So hopefully you know that sodium compounds are white and not green. So straight away, I would write student A, before I go anything further, just reading that first sentence, is incorrect because sodium compounds are white or white. And what else do we know? What else do we know? about um, sodium carbonate as well. What do else do we know about sodium carbonate? So we know that carbonate is soluble and it's told us that it didn't dissolve. So we also know that student A is incorrect because sodium carbonate is soluble. Soluble. Right, now let's think about student B. Um, when we put acid, so what happens when you add acid? So student B said it was copper chloride. Well, it can't be a chloride because we get lime water milky. So we're getting carbon dioxide. So you have to add acid to a carbonate to produce carbon dioxide. So it has to be a carbonate, not a chloride. So we'd say, okay, so student B is also incorrect. And that's because, what can we see? Because we can see, we can see that carbon dioxide is produced. is produced and carbonates produce carbon dioxide. Now that's a tricky question, but it's four marks. If you had got half of those, you're doing quite well. So in total, that's an 18 mark question. And the entire question is on that topic of chemical analysis. So out of your entire paper, 18 marks is quite a lot of marks. So I hope that was useful. Um, I know that was quite short, but it's just to cover that little bit of that topic. 
Um, I'll be doing maths at 3.30. It'll be foundation, GCSE maths, ratio and proportion. I've had a few requests for certain things. So I've picked out questions for those particular topics on the foundation and we'll be going through them um, and leaving the WJC, um, the WJEC paper till tomorrow. Um, so I hope that was useful. Leave me any comments and any questions.